All right. So, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Itai Shakuri, and with me today is uh, Rafael Ko. We're from the open source team at Aqua Security. Um, our team builds a variety of uh, open source uh, solutions for the cloud native security space. One of the um, projects, Tracy, which is a runtime security tool that is using uh, BPF. And we wanted to share our story with of building and ship Tracy, which is an eBPF application, and tell them our point of view, uh, share maybe feedback and maybe there's for others in the same uh, view as us. Uh, we're a vendor, we're not a user. We're uh, building a product that is being used by others. Uh, we're not uh, uh, instrumenting our own class or trying to solve a problem for our own, which means that we don't necessarily get the, the same level of control that some of the uh, some of the others have. Maybe our users don't, don't even have the same level of control because they are running in uh, restricted or managed or, uh, compliant environment. And uh, we have some challenges <clears throat> while uh, building this. Uh, uh, traditionally, I hope all of our other tools are Go. We love Go. It helps us build uh, quickly and ship it to any platform very easy. And uh, Tracy is the first eBPF kind of product that we build. And we wanted to replicate this experience for the user, the user experience uh, of running uh, this tool. Um, our, philosophy, uh, our philosophy generally is that we favor uh, user experience, even if we need to work a little bit harder. And this is what we did in this case. And uh, we will share our journey there. The end goal is to basically achieve something similar like Docker RC. This is like the end goal. Even for people who are not um, familiar with eBPF, doesn't have access to the operating system configuration, don't know what channel headers are, and so we still want to give them the same level of experience. <clears throat> All right, so let's start by uh, presenting where we, it's not where we're at, but it's a good uh, place to start discussion. So we have this Docker image, Tracy. This is how we ship Tracy. It has the um, CLI binary, which is written in this is the user space application. And we'll run this container. We'll uh, compile the eBPF code. There's a, a lot of eBPF probe that we uh, used. Uh, and it will compile on the target machine so that people can run this. It will compile eBPF probe, load it, and it work. In order for this to work, we also needed to uh, bundle into this container uh, not just the source code, but all of the runtime dependencies, uh, all of the tool chain, and so on. Uh, the external dependency that we have here is the kernel headers that the user expected to provide and mount into the container. So uh, the drawbacks here is that it's a long startup time image as you can imagine user still needs to mess around with headers we need to run with the code that tries to do the kernel headers for every decision um, it was actually but it's not the best experience in our minds um, and we wanted to improve so uh, the next step is we did a uh, slight variation it's not really an improvement basically a slim image this is the image on the right here, which contains just this, the user's Go application. And it expects the user to uh, provide the compiled eBPF object that they have uh, compiled using the first container. So it's more appropriate to use this in product because the image uh, is smaller. Uh, it's, it's more suitable for production, but we didn't resolve any of the uh, friction that we had, still need to compile the VPF, still need to uh, mess around with headers. Actually, we introduced more challenges. Now the user needs to think about how to distribute the VPROB to all of the nodes where they run Tracy. They also need to handle um, cases where the fleet is not uh, homogeneous, if it's not the same kernel version exactly. So, um, we really liked uh, to move our code, the if code to core, compile, run everywhere. 
This is a, a shift that we've made a while ago. Uh, this talk is not about that. Uh, I'm assuming you're familiar with that. If not, there's a wonderful blog post here by Andre that introduces the concept and, uh, and how to do it, actually. Uh, it wasn't uh, a frictional experience for us to rewrite the header file. We'll share some of the challenges that we had. Uh, but in essence, uh, it improved the, the experience for us because now we ship this container that has the CLI binary, the portable BPF object, not the code, but the compiled object, which is portable, and it will run whenever there's a BPF uh, available and uh, basically replace the address external dependency that we expected the users to provide with the BTF external dependency. And uh, you know how it works. The distro has, a, if the kernel has a config debug in BTF flag, then uh, uh, the BTF will be available on this kernel BTF VM Linux, and libpf will load it. Um, so this, this, this also just works. Uh, on support the uh, um, on supported the uh, or kernels, and uh, um, some of the challenges that we had here, and basically this this talk is about to to share the challenges or the approaches that we took. Um, it was first of all um, we now had a very strict requirement of BPF. Tracy started the CC application actually in Python. And we wrote it in Go BPF. From my advisor, uh, at the time, Go BPF didn't support um, or didn't change signs of supporting core. Uh, Cilium wasn't uh, ready for tracing use cases. So the easiest, um, the easiest way for us to move forward is just wrap libpf uh, with our uh, own Go library. We call it libpf Go, and it's also a project we open sourced on GitHub. But this is how a very simple, uh, very simple Go application uh, looks like with uh, libpf go um, we try to be more friendly to the developer so it's struct oriented it reads errors it um, uses um, channels and, and all of the go uh, fancy features and uh, we like it others it uh, we have uh, communities who are using it and contributing and we're very happy with it so that was like the lift. It died. Sorry, your yeah. sound is super choppy. Uh, I don't know, maybe try to turn off the video and turn it on or something like that, but it's kind of hard to follow sometimes. Um, I don't know if that's bandwidth right. problem or not. But... I've removed the video. So far, I so good. The... All right, I'll uh, the video. No, it actually still choppy. Yeah, feel free to turn it on. And... Um, yeah, I'll keep it off anyway. I'll try to speak maybe louder. Or... Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. So, um, libpf go was one um, one problem that we saw this way. Uh, the other uh, challenge was that we now have this dependency of ETF, and the uh, user has this actually. Um, dependency and uh, taking from the libpf mirror hub uh, where if is actually available um, we can summarize and say it's pretty much on any recent um, only re uh, any recent uh, we expect it to be available but not today then tomorrow for sure but uh, we need to remember we are a vendor this is like when we talked about we have a different point of view uh, we need to support customers older uh, kernel well, and this was an actual challenge for us. So we thought about what if we could uh, replace the system provider, uh, system provided BTF with our own BTF. We will just uh, replace the BTF with our own. So uh, we looked at um, libbit, uh, libbit, and uh, initially it was a little bit disgusting. We saw that it's uh, uh, hard coded looking from uh, locations, but uh, uh, there was a session in the mailing list, and so there was a patch that did the BTF custom path option to the options, and that was great. This is exactly what we want to do, and we quickly, quickly added the support in libpf go 
as well. Uh, as you can see here, we pretty much pass it uh, directly to libp. We don't really do anything with it. And this is how uh, we can now load uh, external BTFs. How do we generate the BTF? You fill the gaps for unsupported uh, kernels. So we can see here that uh, basically just use Pahol. We can do the same. By the way, it's Pahol for a lot of things, amazing. Tool. And uh, basically, Pahol minus J, exactly what we need. If we can in the correct debug info um, symbols. So we wrote a um, quick uh, POC. We, uh, for different uh, distros that we wanted to port for different versions, go ahead and find the debug the info packages in the package repository. We extract VM Linux um, and uh, convert it to BF using Pahol. And now we have this uh, library of different BTFs for many different uh, versions that we care about. Um, and this is this library is what we now call a BTF Hub. So this is a, a project that we spun off kind of this experience. It's on uh, Aqua Security slash beta, a BTF Hub. And basically go over a lot of different distros, a lot of different versions, uh, get the info in different ways, every different distro, and using it will generate the library of all the Fs. It's here and on GitHub. The, the, the big files are available on GitHub. So our client um, application, when, when it runs and it finds that it in the VM Linux uh, in the system provided path, it will just try to download React one from GitHub. And this is how we are able to overcome this uh, this one challenge. So we are uh, on a mission now to uh, kind of create a, a good coverage of different uh, rows and configurations and versions that we care about. Um, we also, you know, share your feedback to hear what you think about it. Uh, we all, actually, this is the time that we openly speak about, uh, but people all found out and our friends at talk already started using it or tried to use it in, um, in Gadget, their project. So again, we appreciate collaboration back. Uh, anything you want to uh, um, feel free to experiment with and uh, try to use it. So now Rafael can share a little bit about uh, the challenge in actually porting the uh, BPF code to be uh, portable. Can we switch control to work? All right. Can you hear me well? Okay. So, so the idea here is to present uh, some of what we think are the most common challenges for someone that is willing to turn a non-core eBPF application into a core one. Challenges happen not only because of eBPF uh, peculiarities, but also because of legacy Linux distributions and their kernel support. We have split uh, the challenges into those uh, three sections, which I'll be covering in the next slides. So, uh, first challenge being explored is portability issues. Someone uh, willing to create a portable application uh, should be aware of. The road for someone to move from non-core EPPF software to core capable one would be to move from steps one and two to steps uh, three and four. If we want to maintain compatibility with older kernels, then BPF prog type tracing is not the way to go as it requires kernels uh, 5.4 and higher. And considering uh, traces is still supporting 4.19 uh, kernels, uh, that is not up, an option to us. So let's say you have a non-core eBPF code and you make that move. This is when your eBPF application issues will start to happen. Uh, whenever you start testing the same code base in different distributions and kernel versions. Um, the initial issue will be likely uh, your development model and testing environment. Uh, simply compiling and loading eBPF objects, making sure that there are no verifier issues uh, in your 
a development environment does not necessarily mean that you're safe from other kernels verifiers troubles and unfortunately they happen um, because Tracy needs to support many different kernel uh, versions, we may need to tailor our software capabilities based on the running environment. So uh, programs like Tracy might have to, to have reduced capability to keep compatibility with older kernels, but never lose the functionality. As you can see in this slides example, uh, here we are reducing uh, the amount of path components being analyzed in a path resolution on road loop depending on the kernel versions we're running at, uh, this will reduce uh, program size and complexity through uh, and complexity enough so the older kernel verifiers can accept it. Um, so another challenge might be the use of tail calls. Its initial uh, use case started to simplify complex programs by splitting them into smaller ones or as a dispatch uh, routine, depending on the trace events, which is the case being showed here in this slide, as you have, as we have different dispatcher, depending on the syscall types that are, we are probing, and they're all defined during uh, user, uh, in user land during load time. The good thing is that user space can build the program chains on the fly, and that bad thing is also that because it adds more complexity to user land. A quick parenthesis here, uh, with the prog array recent auto uh, population feature, we might not need to do that anymore. But uh, before the, uh, so before the BPF program stack size limit was raised, there was indeed a need to have the tail calls at this patch routine, even for the simple cases, as it would allow us to reduce the prob prob program's uh, complexity. Alternative would be to rely in most recent bigger stack size limits by raising program sizes and reducing the tail cost complexity within our code, but we would break compatibility with older uh, kernels. So Tracy chooses to keep compatibility on the tail cost uh, and the tail cost complexity. Um, second challenge explored is uh, libpf support uh, of all needed uh, features which to be honest is bigger than any other loader attempt. Uh, because we have opted to create our own libpf based Go library, uh, we must keep libpf Go working with latest changes in libpf. Some key functionalities to our libpf application like having the ability to detach all maps and reattach them on the fly, uh, depending on the application business logic might still suffer some changes before fully stable 1.0 libbpf API, for example, that must be addressed in our library sooner than later. So uh, as an example, uh, running CI uh, in our code with every upstream change from libbpf is something uh, we do. Uh, this example shows a tentative of another third-party project that also uses libbpf Go to implement the detach method for their needs without the destruction and disconnection uh, logic in place for the in-upstream libbpf library. So when developing uh, the legacy kprobe support, uh, we had issues when trying to detach attached links if the perf event file descriptors were not closed, for example. This has uh, recently been improved with the BPF link back backed by file descriptors feature. But like any other new feature, we always have to seek backwards compatibility uh, with our code. So our approach in libbpf Go is to have libbpf to support everything. Um, and we just wrap it using C Go to re-implement. And we re-implement uh, in pure Go, things that we really, really need, uh, mostly because of C Go performance penalty, like for example, uh, pulling file descriptors and things alike. Uh, in other words, we'd rather contribute to libpf loader if missing any feature and to solve punctual problems on our side instead of trying to reinvent uh, the wheel. <clears throat> so, Currently, there are multiple BPF link attachment techniques being done by libbpf, at least about to be merged. When we first started using libbpf, it only supported perf event IOC set BPF attachment type. 
Unfortunately, in order to support 4.15 and 4.19 kernels, uh, we needed legacy K-probe events interface uh, to be supported. Andrew already had a draft uh, in the mailing list and we continued that work. Uh, currently, uh, libpf first checks if the running kernel supports bpf link create command to have the file descriptor for the link. And this has been recently uh, added and if the kernel does not support it, then it moves on into uh, old uh, perf, perf event IOC set BPF call. Uh, if the legacy kprobe event interface is not needed in our case for older kernels. So in order to have uh, core capabilities in older kernels, two important changes were requested. First one allowing libpf to set current version attribute before the ebpf program was loaded. The second and most important is the legacy kprobe events interface support that I just talked about in the previous slide. And it allows the kernels 4.19 to have core enabled libpf apps. A quick note for anyone willing to use those, uh, Andrew has just simplified this code and added legacy uprobe support as well. So I would uh, either wait for libpf 06 to be available or uh, make sure to have latest patches backported uh, to your application if you are compiling it uh, statically with libpf like sometimes we do, or maybe most of the time. Mm. So here's a tiny pause to check on eBPF elf sections, headers, and symbol tables. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time here, but since uh, some people in the audience uh, should be aware of, I'll just quickly describe some, some things. So differently than uh, an object file produced by Clang or GCC to a regular architecture, let's say, it would contain uh, sections such as RELA, text, data, BSS. In eBPF object case, we'll have link time relocations made by libpf before the eBPF programs are loaded in kernel. So each eBPF prog bits section describes a program and needs different types of relocations depending on what type of data the eBPF program of that particular section is trying to access. Uh, some relocations are kconfs, others are kseams. The first depends on kconfig variables from the running kernel configuration file. And the last is uh, the last uh, is about the different data the eBPF program is trying to access, and then we have the regular uh, the usual eBPF elf sections to know of, but that is already probably known for everyone. So dot .btf, dot .btf .x, maps dot maps. Uh, continuing, so the third challenge is a continuation of the check second challenge, uh, the libpf support, but with a specific some concern of kconfig relocations. When turning our eBPF software core enabled, obviously we sometimes missed some uh, BPF helper calls, conversions, and similar things. So the next three slides refer to the same challenge and they are connected. Uh, what happened here is that our core code would run just fine in all kernels above 5.4, but not in the ones below it. And after a reversed bisection, uh, the committing charge for fixing the behavior was related to BPF verifier being thought about read only uh, ebpf maps having their values interpreted as scholars uh, so the verifier would do the that code elimination correctly in our case the missing verification feature uh, uh, was kind of good because it made us realize we had a bug if the os did not have config arch has his call wrapper enabled the other branch did not have the correct core call making the verifier to fail continuing in the same example. So we have fixed uh, the issue by placing correct BPF probe read call to read addresses referring to arguments and registers. We have also proposed a verifier fix to 5.4, a stable branch, as it made sense, but it wasn't terribly required, but uh, we thought it would be good. This also raised the question to us about having verifier uh, fixes and things alike always being applied to stable branches, but I confess I have not digged into, into it and I assume fixes are being suggested to stable branches as they make sense. And with that said, there is a bit more in this exam example still. If you see the kconfig symbol evaluation, we were using regular extern variable 
that was having its symbol relocated by libpf before load time based on the value being caught by the kconfig parser within libpf and we don't have that anymore So the reason why we implemented an eBPF map containing values from kconfig variables instead of letting libpf to do the relocations for us was that we wanted to get rid of proc config file, uh, file dependency uh, of libpf. And by removing kconf relocation types, libpf does, uh, does not need uh, the kconfig file to exist. This is not necessarily a corner case, but it helps in end user usability since eBPF software might be running as a container in a Kubernetes cluster, for example. Uh, another thing to notice is that libpf already does support external kconfig files apart from the regular OS ones, just as external BTF files for the BTF relocations. But unfortunately, the external kconfig files aren't able to replace entirely the OS kconfig file dependency. They are considered just as extra options on top of a must-have kconfig file. With a simple macro, we now have an approach that serves both core and non-core compilations, uh, considering Tracy still has to support uh, compilation during load time. And now the last challenge, uh, the fourth challenge is also a continuation of the second one. It's the libpf support, but with a specific concern of kSIMS relocations in our environments, even in those with old kernels. And that goes uh, together with what Itai was saying. So after sorting uh, all types of challenges, the last one uh, was to have external BTFs implemented into Tracy in a way that the end user would not worry if running the kernel uh, would have BTF data available or not. Uh, Tracy would be responsible to, through BTF hub download, if needed, cache and use it from cache, the BTF files for the running kernel. So this slide shows the initial call of Tracy downloading uh, the BTF file for a hardware enablement kernel in Ubuntu Bionic. Those kernels don't support BTF because Ubuntu Launchpad Builders only rely in packages from the main uh, archive and they don't include latest versions of Paho backported as Paho is included in the Dwarves package and that is considered a quite important change for the distribution. There's a bug opened to solve that issue by, uh, by having a more recent static compiled, uh, statically compiled Paho binary available to build the hardware, uh, hardware enablement kernels, but that bug has not been solved yet. Does the need for BTF hub, not only for Ubuntu, but for other distributions as well. Okay, so that's it. With all that said, I'll give the speech back to Itai and thanks. Can I have control back, please? Thank you. Uh, um, all right, thanks, Rafael. Um, so I just want to acknowledge uh, another, uh, I don't know, maybe approach to solve some of these uh, challenges. This is an example from Project Falco, which is another security tool. Um, and um, it's also an approach that you consider that I want address that. So basically what we see here on the right is that uh, they uh, cross-compile their uh, uh, driver or probe to every target um, kernel that they support. They host all of those effects in the cloud. Then their, um, ally, their, their um, actual uh, application can detect the environment, uh, go to this uh, cloud-hosted repository to download the appropriate uh, BPF object file that should be on the, on the, tar on the kernel. Uh, something we considered before BTF, and uh, we actually, as you can see here, uh, started to discuss with the folks and also had a branch where we contributed uh, support to make their um, build infrastructure generic so that we can build another eBPF progress uh, in a similar version. And I wanted to address that and, uh, you know, note this uh, list of kernels, version specific articles, uh, before that seeing the same list of in BTF Hub, 
um, and kind of just think about it this way, where um, the Falco approach, where you first compile something to meet the target, you fix the artifact to meet the environment, essentially what cross compilation does. And what we want to do with the F-Hub is, sir, but the reverse. We want to fix the environment to work on the same artifact. And the benefit here is that you can reuse always the same artifact. It's always the portable core compile once run under uh, BPF code. Or is the same BPF code, just maybe fix the environment if we see that we need to. Um, so having a... Uh, surveyed all the journey that we've uh, through from BCC, OBPF and LibPF Go, CRE and BTF Hub, uh, uh, we wanted to also think about what's next uh, in the public. And uh, we don't really consider BTF Hub, uh, Tracy with BTF Hub, I think it's not really truly portable eBPF application because it depends on the BF Hub to be, to be available. So what could we do? to achieve a truly portable application, uh, ideas. One of them, <clears throat> as we can talk, is to be, uh, instead of using a BTF file in Linux that contains all the types, maybe we can just have a BTF file with just the types that it needs. Uh, it's only a small subset than what's uh, available in Linux. And using file, um, we can choose one or many different uh, types that we bought and expand them it's actually usable and then we can, um, create a still a question specific BTF file but which contains just files just the types that we care so obviously these types would be much uh, smaller BFs. Uh, VM Linux is be quite small uh, but uh, we account for the many different combinations of versions that we want to support Heads up. So this is one direction that we are uh, thinking about. And uh, the other, one, which can work with the first one or not, uh, is to maybe reuse the same, um, the same files across different kernel versions if the types that we care about hadn't changed. So <clears throat> if we did the first step of a uh, application specific BTF file, just diff those files and see if they changed or not. And if they did, then just reuse them maybe. Even if we didn't and we still wanted to ship the full VM Linux, <clears throat> then uh, we can diff the BTFs and see where were changes. And if we care to change it, if we didn't even use anything uh, remote that uh, relates to this, change, maybe we can reuse the same BTF across different versions. So the first gives us smaller BTFs, the second one gives us significantly less BTFs, and potentially with both those uh, changes, um, we can do kind of a, a truly portable eBPF application. So in BTF Hub, we state the kernel uh, specific BTF files, but then create a BTF bundle that contains an application specific <clears throat> uh, BTFs, which is so uh, reduced so that one BTF can support a range of kernel versions. And the bundle would potentially be, potentially be small enough so that we can embed it and ship it with the container or the Go application. And uh, this is what we'd like to think about as a true eBPF application, this is what we're experimenting with at the moment. Uh, if it works, we we'll obviously share everything in GitHub, generate maybe a script that lets you uh, create the BTF for your application. But it's like a next step for us. All right. So if you liked this or find interesting or interesting in everything we talked about, feel free to uh, engage with us. We're in GitHub, uh, slash Aqua Security, Tracy, or LibPF Go, or FHub any one of those repos. We don't have a Slack or a mailing list, but we use GitHub discussion, so you can just discuss with us there. Or if you want to talk with one of the maintainers directly, we're on Twitter, so feel free to, we'll be happy to uh, share ideas. All right, that's it, thank you.
Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, just to give a small recap from what was going on in the chat, Alexei and Lawrence found the BTF hub idea really awesome. So it's great. And I hope that BPF literally doesn't take over the world right now because GitHub will probably die from like all those binaries being downloaded in parallel. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead. And unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to show this, but OK. Hello. Thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, my next question was also going to be, how much traffic are you going to expect your BTF app to generate? Uh, thank you very much for hosting these. Um, one thing that I think I also talked with Andre about a while ago is that right now, like I'm not very familiar with KProps, but it seems like you use it a lot. So my question is basically to you. Um, I think it's currently not possible to have a K-probe that is uh, kind of compatible across arches, I guess. So like ARM64 versus x86. Uh, how do you fix that? Or how does you solve that for your product if you support it? Do you have ideas how that could be solved? Stuff like that. Thank you. Refer we don't. <clears throat> yeah, I couldn't hear you. Not yet. Sorry for that. I had both right, mutes. No. Okay, so uh, most of the times we, we try to use the stable hooks, right? So from the trace points. And uh, we're now trying to, to go through the LSM hooks uh, for uh, specifically, like since we're dealing with security. Uh, we're trying to go through the LSM hooks now, but it's like what you said, you know, if we use uh, uh, the K probes, then we have to make sure that we're considering all different kernels and, and we have to deal with uh, different types being used everywhere. So it's not, it's not an easy thing. That's why we try not to use them <laughs> uh, at least, you know, at, uh, until the last moment, that's it. No magic. Yeah, so maybe that most of the hooks are into uh, into trace points or LSM hooks, and in the rare cases where we get props, it's just we work. So I guess one of the reasons for using like uh, LSM hooks is because you know what sort of what are the set of hooks that you want to use, right? Like for tracing, the the, the attachment surface is basically endless. That's that's a good point. I I wanted to bring this up in my talk as well. Thank you. And hopefully the the distributions will catch up, uh, so we don't have to do things as BTF BTF Hub anymore. You know. Uh, it would be very nice for, so if you take, for example, Fedora, uh, the latest versions and Red Hat latest kernels, they already have backported all the BTF support. It's embedded, you know, uh, BPF and BTF uh, features, they're trying to backport as much as they can. Uh, some other distros are not ca get, catching up very quickly. So that's why we needed the BTF hub. So I, ha I had a small comment about the K config. It's it's kind of interesting. <laughs> I was expecting that like this override would work for you, but you're saying that because you don't have K config, it actually fails even when you provide your own K config. So no one ever complained about that. I think I it would that. be completely reasonable to just uh, say that you know like if custom K config uh, is specified and like the system K config isn't present, then like we should just ignore the All absence right. of the system K config. I think that okay, yeah. okay. Though, like, it will differ. The, the behavior will differ between the systems that have kconfig or not. But I guess, like, when you use the custom kconfig, you sort of sign up for this uh, behavior. I think it should be fine. We can discuss awesome. that on the mailing list. Okay. And for the uh, for the trimming of the BTF, that is a very interesting idea. I would go like half a step further. Like, instead of just saying like, let's keep only like those specified types and maybe like 
related types as well. Why not say, let's keep only types that are actually core relocated from a given BPF object file, right? So the input will be like the full BTF and also your program, compiled program. Uh, I think it makes more sense to add it to BPF tool, honestly, because it knows more about like the BPF ecosystem in general. Uh, but at that point, it can go, it can uh, fetch all the core relocations, it can figure out like all the types that are necessary and keep on the, on the path. So libpf provides all the low level APIs to do this pretty easily, either for Pahol or BPF tool. So it doesn't matter where it's implemented, but it's, it's, it's kind of not hard. Like, so you give it a try. We will do, definitely. Next step. Daniel supports me in the chat. Any other questions from the audience? There was a quick question on where do we get the kconfig files from? This is basically like from the host and uh, we can, the idea here was we can mock some of the kconfig files. So for example, to consider config arch as this call wrapper uh, is enabled, you know, even if we don't know, sometimes we can just try to assume things, you know, so 